Well, I think the 3.4 percent is really a false number. Based on a lot of conversations with a lot of people that do this, I think the number is way under 1 percent. So to fact check, the World Health Organization says the coronavirus death rate is 3.4 percent. President Trump lies that the World Health Organization is wrong. The number is 3.4 percent. 3.4 percent is what is being reported around the world. Making it deadlier so much death. The death rate. The percentage is 3.4 percent. And no hunch from the president can change that. Trump lied about the most recent World Health Organization organization estimate that the global death rate of coronavirus is 3.4 percent. The 3.4 percent death rate was wrong and WHO data later updated it to a fraction of 1 percent. Let's go back into history. Trump has a hunch that the death rate is lower than 1 percent. Way under 1 percent. Way under 1 percent. Will someone put a mozzarella stick in this stupid old Trump lied to viewers about the mortality rate. Way under 1 percent. False information. He's spreading disinformation. Misinformation and dangerous disinformation. If you're president of the United States, you have the world's greatest scientists at your disposal. You listen to them. Leading scientists, including Dr. Fauci, wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine that the death rate could be considerably less than 1 percent. Way under 1%. Why are you going on national television and contradicting experts based on a hunch? His fake hunch with some fake math. The president somehow thinks it could be lower than 1% based on nothing. Based on a lot of conversations with a lot of people that do this. Outright lies. Contradicting health officials on fatality rates. It's not a time for Donald Trump to be calling into cable shows. It's a time for the CDC. What is CDC's best estimate of the fatality rate? It's somewhere between half a percent and 1%. To a fraction of 1%. The president is spreading false information. Information, discarding what the health professionals are saying. Outright bogus information. Science is not based on hunches. A hunch yeah. about what he thinks is going on. Instead of trusting information from doctors and scientists, he has a hunch. Hunch, hunch. A hunch. It's not a time for Donald Trump's hunches. It's a time for science. It's a time for doctors. Welcome, Dr. J. Bhattacharya. Uh, my hypothesis, my hunch, was it was likely to be less deadly than the World Health Organization was saying. 3.4%. There was no way that was true. Really uh, false numbers. This is why I ran the study in April of 2020. And what did you discover? The infection fatality rate was 0.2%. Way under 1%. A pandemic of misinformation. To put out misinformation. Spreading false information. The, the disinformation. Falsehood. Wrong and misleading information. Misleading. Misinformation and misinformation. Misinformation. Just unspeakably reckless. It's totally reckless. It's dangerous to have conflicting messages out there. That is very dangerous. How dangerous is it? Really dangerous. What is the Danger. I think we're in a very dangerous period. Uh, if the president continues to hunt. We're just going to make two videos. We're going to break this up into part one, part two. So there's a scenery video because I did have, well, I hadn't made a video for a while. So I just want to catch some scenery on the way back. Unfortunately, hold on. There, let's see. There we go. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, I got to use UHD 30, which means this video might bounce around a bit because this isn't a gimbal. Ah, uh, this was a uh, Department of Government Efficiency, and boy, this would be wonderful, because we did talk about Mitch McConnell in part one, well, maybe part two also. Uh, Mitch McConnell says there will be no recess appointments for Trump, openly attempting to block Trump's uh, cabinet picks. I wonder how much money this old, um, old man, I'd say old geezer, or old uh, evil bastard, or old demon, has laundered and stolen from the American people over the years. Guess we should check on that. By the way, did you know Mitch McConnell has ties to China? He makes a lot of money from China. And uh, that's, uh, that's a true statement. So anyway, uh, let's keep going. The amount of money that goes into ridiculous spending is outrageous. Watch this clip where I outline some of the absurd wastes of taxpayer money by the federal government. Ooh, let's get that view while we're reading this. Uh, the federal government. This is exactly the type of thing a target. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, Marjorie Taylor Greene is going to be on the um, the um, Department of uh, Government uh, Efficiency. And so this is her talking about that. 
can't imagine anyone being being against it. You know, the the bills that I've had to vote, I voted no. I've never voted to actually fund a budget that has been represented in Congress. When I see things like seventeen million dollars for latrines in Africa, when I see th- when I see grant programs that go to fund um, studies uh, uh, about shrimp on cocaine and their sex lives, when I see the amount of spending that goes into each and every department of the government, it's outrageous to me, and I think it's outrageous to all Americans. Like you just said, who's against um, cutting spending? Um, nobody. No one should be. But you want to know something? The Democrats that I work with and serve with in Congress, they're going to find a way to feign their outrage. And um, the media that, that loses their mind over anything and everything, they're going to feign their outrage. And then they're going to try to talk Americans into being outraged with them. So I look forward to their hissy fits. I think it'll actually be hilarious. And I hope the Democrat Party never changes. I hope they continue to embrace the trans ideology, the ridiculous ch- climate change scam, foreign wars that should never happen, and massive abuse of power and, and ridiculous spending in Washington. If they keep doing that, Brian, we'll keep winning elections and they'll keep losing. Okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about the media. You said this on, on Maria on the Sunday show on Fox uh, News, that uh, you are not against defunding or looking into the uh, f- budgets of organizations like NPR. Mm. Yeah, this is this is an oversight hearing uh, on my committee on Doge. I definitely would like to do. Um, I want to look in every aspect of spending and every program that has been going on for a long time. NPR is it seems to me a big Democrat propaganda machine. I think NPR should come before my committee and talk to me about why uh, they think it's important for for NPR to continue. These are the type of cuts that we're going to have to be willing to make. Uh, they aren't exactly presenting fair and balanced news to the American people. And if that's what they're doing with American people's hard-earned tax dollars, uh, I I think that's going to be a place we'll have to make some cuts. Isn't that a beautiful view? That's where I just want to get the views while we read a couple of these. By the way, I'm I'm doing this one-handed. It's pretty good. I'm doing it with my right hand. I was trying to do it with my left hand because with scenery photos, I'm I'm learning here. I'm learning here. Uh, This is uh, Insurrection Barbie. The media is setting the stage for Joe Biden to pardon Hunter Biden. Why all the pretending? Why not just be honest and say that you were always on to going to pardon your son? Not even mad at that. I just think it's devious because they withhold that information uh, pending either Kamala's potential victory or his own when the people already knew the, how the Democrats operate. Get another view there. This was always going to be a pardon. Sorry. Um... Uh, it, it, I'm telling you, it's operating with one hand. I hit the wrong damn button. Get back down to my. This is uh, Steve Moore. I go. Oh, oh, that. This is a good one. This I, I, I thought this was pretty cool. So this is Elon Musk. Uh, a friend of mine had a meeting with senior officials at SEC, and they hadn't been in the building <laughs> for so long, they couldn't figure out how to turn on the lights. <laughs> So they were just sitting there in the dark with cell phone flashlights looking like uh, demented burglars. And this was from Austin Capital, Steve, Steve Moore. I guess this must be Elon's friend. He says, I go into this big federal building and it's almost like they're haunted. It's spooky. There's nobody there. Nobody wants to show up. It's ridiculous. Elon Musk and Vivek want to fi- fix this with the Department of Government Efficiency. Now, if you didn't know... Uh, during the cough, uh, all the federal workers started working from home. And part of the thing supporting the economy right now is under the Biden administration, we've hired a shitload of, of uh, federal workers. And so they're just chilling out at home, probably drinking beer, <laughs> you know, uh, working. And so one of the things that uh, Trump said he's going to do is require federal workers to go into work. And a lot of them say they're going to quit. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe... They can do that if they want, but it's, it's, I'm going to tell you, there's no job better than a government job. You get a pension. You get, uh, uh, you get to work uh, minimal hours. A lot of them only work about six hours a day, uh, you know, or, or less than that, some five. Uh, you know, and then, of course, you, uh, you get uh, full benefits, and, and, uh, and the work is easy. You don't even have to do anything hardly. So let's, uh, let's get the view again. So, Attorney General, a court just sided with my team again, ruling Missouri, Missouri's voter ID law 
will remain intact. We went to the court and put the evidence and the radical activists voting to undermine our elections failed. This is a huge win for election security. Now, can you imagine this battle's going on in Missouri? I didn't even know that. And of course, Elon said, congratulations, uh, A.G. Bailey. Um, let's see. Oh, here's another video for you. Uh, oh my God, I didn't even get to this in the first part of the video. This was, you know, I, I've been talking about the Surgeon General and how I don't think she's a good pick. And uh, this is Tech Judge. Trump's pick for Attorney General. Let's, uh, let's get that view of the clouds again. For Surgeon General, Jeanette Nishiwat praised Facebook for censoring anti-vaccine information, adding that she will hope and pray other social media companies do the same. Let's watch that video now. First of all, vaccines save lives. And I am so excited and I thank and I commend Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg for taking action because this affects everyone. This affects our children, it affects adults. I mean, just look at the recent measles outbreak, the biggest outbreak that we've had in decades with measles. And, and that's no joke. Measles can cause brain inflammation and pneumonia and ear infections and hearing loss and death. So it's about time that they are taking action. And I hope and pray that other social media platforms will follow suit and do the same thing so that's what i'm saying i anybody that's for censorship and elon man you're supposed to be against censorship why are you letting this happen you know i also want to talk about brian kemp for a minute there's another evil freaking rhino do you know that he cost the republicans the two senate seats he went to voter mail-in ballots in georgia with no uh no uh thought or process and of course he's got a a democrat um what do you call him, Secretary of State that managed this election? I call him Ratburger, that Ratburger uh, son of a gun. And that's how the Democrats were able to cheat in Georgia and get two, uh, two Senate seats. So I want you to recall that, uh, people of Georgia, when you go to vote for Brian Kemp. Lord, that looks good. I just love these views, man, don't you? So uh, this is uh, going on to a completely different topic because I've ra ranting and raved about this and Elon Musk, I thought this was a great post because I had to think about things because you know I was in the Air Force for uh, for a few years anyway. The F-30 design was broken at the requirements level because it was required to be too many things to too many people. This made it an expensive and complex jack of all trades, master of none. Success was never in the set of possible outcomes and man fighter jets are obsolete in the age of drones anyway. We'll just get pilots killed and I, when, I, when you say drones, you also got to know about the anti-aircraft defenses. You know, those F-35s that were flying in from Israel to, uh, to uh, Iran, uh, those radars locked on. And that's what scared the hell out of the Israeli pilots. They'd never been locked on before because they're supposed to be stealth fighters. Now, I wanted to talk about fighters for just a minute. Maybe we'll get some more video here in a few. Was, okay, you know, the way the Air Force was broken up. I'll just keep you on the sky. How's that? The way the Air Force was broken up was we had, uh, uh, you know, a different fighter for a different purpose. You had the A-10 Warthog, which was basically a ground support aircraft, and that's the one that I worked on, okay? Then you had the F-16, which is kind of an aerial dogfighter, you know, the Tom Cruise, remember? Uh, um, top Gun, that's your Top Gun fighter right there. You know, the, the, the A-10 Warthog is just a flying tank. Flies over, you know, it, it can get hit by a couple of anti-aircraft missiles and still keep flying. You know, whereas the F-16, it gets hit and boom, it's gone. Plus, the F-16 requires a premier runway. It's a, it's a FOD vacuuming machine. So in a, in a wartime environment, if you can just hit the runway and create a bunch of FOD, F-16s can't take off. Whereas the A-10 Warthog has the engines mounted up on the back of the wings. So it can actually take off in some pretty, uh, pretty uh, uh, well, what do I want to say, debris filled situations. So the runway doesn't have to be perfect for an A-10, although it can still suck up into those engines, don't get me wrong. You, know, you want your own runway to be as clean as possible, but what I'm saying is it doesn't have to be perfect like it does with the F-16. You know, then we had the F-22, which came out, and it had a specific purpose. So what I'm saying is you develop weapon systems with a specific purpose in mind. You don't try to make one weapon system to be the be all and end all. You know, same with, uh, with vehicles. Okay, you know, what the way the, the military industrial complex works, you know, we've got carrier fleets right now. You know, they're obsolete. They're obsolete. It's ridiculous. There's no reason, I mean, that Russian missile, the uh, hazelnut, 
Because I want to call it hazelnut. <laughs> I'm not going to use the Russian name. All right. It, that, that thing's precision got it. If it comes down on a carrier fleet, number one, the carrier is definitely gone. And probably some of the ships right around it. And I don't know how much that missile costs to make. I imagine it's in the millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. But think about what it takes to make an aircraft carrier. Plus, every single one of those F-35s, I think they're like $600 million. Well, in today's dollars, it'll be a billion dollars here soon. And, uh, but I mean, so, so now that one Russian missile in the hundreds of millions of dollars can take out, good God, I don't, I don't even know how many billions of dollars of U.S. military equipment. So carriers, and, and so, but the military industrial complex, all they care about is making money. Yeah, and I've talked in the past about the Humvee. That was the biggest fiasco ever. It was the worst vehicle. I mean, it's too wide. You can't get down streets, you know, in urban warfare, as we found out in Iraq. It, it was a death trap. There was no uh, armor underneath the floor. So you run over an IED and it blows your legs off or, or kills you. You know, the, 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 the doors were made out of canvas originally. And then, of course, they tried to retrofit them with armor. But it, you, you have to design everything. Now, think about a house. Let's say you're a carpenter. You know, you have to design things from the ground up. You know, if you don't have a good foundation, then you're, you're not, you can't build, I mean, you could build a house, but the house is probably not going to be uh, good, and eventually it's probably just going to fall down. All right, same with uh, a vehicle. You can't go back and remake a vehicle. You have to design it from the ground up to make it a good vehicle. All right, so when they realize, and of course the Bronco. Bronco was the greatest vehicle ever. That was when I, when I was driving the captain around, that was my job in the Army. I always chose the Bronco. I never drove the Humvee. And uh, he, I, he asked me that question, that cybersecurity guy, why do you always choose the Bronco? I said, because I can take this Bronco places those Humvees can't go, Captain. And also, it's, uh, it does better in a lot of circumstances. You know, those Humvees, they, they're actually good in open desert, better than the Bronco, because the Bronco could get stuck in places those Humvees could go. But other than that, and so there you go. Now, if you wanted to say a vehicle for a specific purpose, you know, and later on we, we developed uh, uh, equipment uh, for, for IEDs. But then they, we shipped all those to Ukraine. <laughs> so, so we don't have any of those vehicles anymore. Oh man, look at that. Woo wee. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll add some more to the videos we go along since I'm making two videos. You know, and that's, and that's another thing, you know, I don't know about you, you know, sometimes, especially the people that are sick on Thanksgiving Day, there's nothing to watch unless you go around and watch some movies. Which, by the way, I watched two good movies last night. You know what I'm getting into on Netflix? They got these Chinese movies. And, uh, boy, I tell you, the choreography in those things is fantastic. And, of course, you know, they've, they've translated it to English, but they did a good job. I mean, it's so well done that when they're moving their lips, even though you know they're speaking Chinese, it sounds just like English. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I mean, so it's, it's believable. So you don't even have to have subtitles on to understand what they're saying. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's all far-fetched, but if you're into fantasy and stuff, I'm telling you, those movies, the Chinese are making a hell of a lot better movies than uh, Hollywood is right now. Definitely check those out. I can't remember the name of the last one that I watched. It's like two hours. Unfortunately, the way the Chinese do it is it, it doesn't end. It's like, you know, the next movie will come out and God knows when you'll get to the next movie. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know. Uh, so that, I was kind of like, man, I watched two hours of this thing. And now I, I don't even know what the ending's going to be, you know, but uh, that's okay. The, it was nonstop, you know, karate and fighting and, you know, people flying over buildings and all that crazy stuff. I just, I just love that stuff, man, I, especially when you just want some, some mindless entertainment. All right, we'll get, we'll get some more here in just a minute. Ah, here's another one to talk about at that Thanksgiving Day table. This is Insurrection Barbie again. See, here's where we are. The resistance. It's not a resistance against Donald Trump. It's resistance against the American people who elected him. The second plotting and constant attempts to derail Donald Trump's agenda are not about Donald Trump. They are about invalidating the mandate of the American people. Because Democrats hate representative democracy. So when you're at that Thanksgiving table, say, why do you hate representative democracy? You know, because they obviously do. Let's uh, see here. Oh, good. All right. Megatron, the British ambassador said that the UK is ready to send troops to fight Israel against Iran. 
The United Kingdom will be a close ally and is prepared to put its own aircraft and its own personnel in harm's way to defend Israel, says Ambassador Simon Walters, speaking to Israel journalists in a remnant uh, Gan residence. Now, the reason I wanted to read that was I got a comment on the video, on a video, that Israel, I mean Britain, are anti-Semitic. Why can't you talk about genocide in Gaza? Because, uh, because there, there isn't any genocide in Gaza. A, there is no such thing as Palestine. Do you know what the etymology of the word Palestinian is? It was a name invented by the Roman Empire. Yeah, the problem is, Jews. the problem is, it's an impartial no, no, interlocutor. No, no, I, I, you let, know let that is not shared by let, the rest me, of the world. The, the rest point. of the world disagrees you know, with no. you. So you're going to be as ice, you're going to be a game. I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you talk for the rest of the world. I'm glad you talk for the rest of the world. Such, you mentioned the word well, it's Hubris. the United Nations General Assembly My resolution. My God. I said, hell no. I said, they're sending weapons to, uh, to uh, Israel. Well, that's just the government. The people are anti-Semitic. I said, I don't think the people are anti-Semitic. I said, they're probably doing other. So now they're talking about sending troops. Now, okay, if you're an Israeli troop and you're anti-Semitic, are you going to go fight for Israel? Probably not. Of course, I wouldn't do it anyway. <laughs> I wouldn't do it regardless. But, and I'm not anti-Semitic. I just don't agree with what Israel's doing, and I don't want to fight for it. You know? I, I, in fact, I, up until the October 7th, I always believed all the propaganda about Israel, that they were an ally and, you know, they, that we, uh, you know, they're, they're the chosen people of the Bible and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I, any people that can do what they've done to the Lebanese and to Gaza and, and trying to provoke a war with Iran and, you know, and I, the horror pictures that I've seen, you know, of kids with, the, with you know, wounds blown apart. Women with their legs gone, you know. I imagine, where are the liberal women on all the women that have been killed in Gaza? I go, well, I guess that there's Palestinian, they're obviously subhuman. That's, that's, that's the way that goes, you know. They're not really human beings, they're animals. They're animals and they must be exterminated. That's it, that's it, that's it, all right. All right, I wanted to get this on the video because a guy gave me a comment. <laughs> I love my comments, man. Keep them coming. He goes, you wish you wish upon a star tonight. He says, well, that's probably a planet. Well, yeah, I knew that. I mean, but, you know, it's it, it, anyway. But, yeah, that's probably a planet. Just wanted to get you that view. All right, here's another view of that planet. And I know it's probably not the smartest thing in the world to be out here in the dark, especially without a headlamp. But I just like hiking in the dark, although the possibility of stepping on a snake <laughs> or getting attacked by a bear. Or, hell, I've even seen deer run into cars. It might be one of them running into me. But anyway, I just love, it's just the beauty of it. It's just too much for me not to enjoy. Well, because this is gonna be two videos, I wanted to add on one other thing. By the way, this is all over the uh, newspapers in Russia. God dang it, I, I think of these things as I go along. I don't know how Alex does it. He keeps himself, well, of course he keeps his videos too. If you notice, I, maybe it's probably a requirement on Rockfin or one of the channels they post to, because uh, I'm not limited in the time on X or, uh, well, I haven't found the limit yet <laughs> because I don't make more, just slightly over an hour occasionally. But uh, uh, anyway, um, but he keeps his videos to half an hour and maybe that's how he managed it. So don't think that, you know, when you watch clip after clip that, you know, criticize me. Uh, but uh, I wanted to talk about the dollar for a minute because that was a topic that we got into on this video. And so in the Russian newspapers, they were talking about how they no longer use dollars for anything. And they were saying that much of the rest of the world is, is, is obviously getting away from the dollar. And then I, I forgot what we did to Saudi Arabia. We did something to them. Oh, we, I think we were supporting Israel when they said they wanted to take out Saudi Arabia next. So Saudi Arabia is, is working on an alliance with Iran. Can you believe that? We have brought... Since the 6th century, <laughs> the, the, the Shia and the Sunni have hated each other in the Arab world. They've been at odds for centuries. And what did the Democrats succeed in doing? They brought the Muslim world together against the Christians and the Zionists. And so are the, the radical Christians, I guess I should say. Not, maybe not all Christians. But I mean, isn't that outrageous? So it looks like Saudi Arabia and Iran are going to team up. I, can you, I, I can't believe how fast the world is changing. But anyway, getting back to the dollar. <coughs> is, uh, 
big. So that means Saudi Arabia, they're probably going to dump their treasuries. And China is in the process of dumping its treasuries. And you have to understand the dollar is a debt-based instrument. So all those dollars are rushing back fairly quickly to the United States. We've already taken out one major superpower that's getting away from the dollar. Of course, India is buying all of their Russian oil in, uh, in the ruble. So they're not using dollars for that transaction. Same in China is, of course, buying everything from Iran outside of the dollar. I just want to see, see how things are going. And I'm sure Brazil is trading with China and Russia. And by the way, it's another thing. Mexico is now uh, uh, become a trading partner with China. And of course, Trump is threatening to sanction Mexico. So that doesn't make them our friend very much. And that was another thing. <laughs> oh my God, I just keep going off. I watch way too much news. Is that Mexico says what they're going to do is they're going to bring in Chinese goods that are sanctioned and then they're going to sell them to the United States to avoid the Chinese sanctions. So you see how the, this whole thing keeps going. But I mean, it, it, it's changing so fast. I dare say within the next two years now. So what happens when all that debt, all these trillions upon trillions upon trillions, maybe it's a quad trillion or quad zillion. Or <laughs> we don't even know what number we're up to. When all these dollars and nobody's using them except people here in the United States and nobody wants them. And so you can't buy goods from China. You can't buy goods you know, from Mexico. Uh, you know, and we have no manufacturing. What do you think's going to happen? That's why I said it's mathematically impossible to balance the federal budget enough to keep the dollar from going to zero. Right now, it's worth three cents of what it was back in 1913. Imagine that. The dollar has devalued all the way down to three cents. So next year, it'll make be two cents, let's say one and a half cents. And then the following year, you're looking at maybe half a cent of what the dollar was worth in 2013. You gotta put it all in perspective, people. It's going to zero. Hold on to your jack straps and prepare as best you can. And I forgot to tell you on the other clip about assets. Assets don't have to be in gold, silver, platinum, palladium, real estate. It's whatever you want it to make. Anything that you can make that other people want is an asset. Okay? The dollar is not an asset. It's a debt instrument. So you got to get out of dollars and into assets. And so you can use your imagination. You know, it could be like Johnny Bravo. You could develop a product that you're going to sell. Maybe, and then you'll just take, in, at some point, you'll just be taking gold and silver for that, that product, okay? And then, you know, the other thing you want to do is right now, if you need anything, if you need new windows in your house, if you need that new washer and dryer, if you need a, a, a new hair dryer, I don't care what it is, you know, a new car. Well, I wouldn't buy a new car right now. I buy, you can get the used cars, but wait a little while, because cars are going to come way down, even with the dollar devaluing, which means you're going to get the car even cheaper. All right, because, uh, you know, I saw that um, Hertz is selling all of their Tesla cars. So that's that's crazy right there. Uh, so uh, you, you can pick up a Tesla from Hertz if you want want an electric car. Uh, so that's, that's another possibility. But what I'm saying is, is anything that you need to buy, it's going to, a lot of stuff's going to get more expensive. That TV is definitely going to get a hell of a lot more expensive. Because <laughs> so you, anything coming out of China is going to get more expensive. So, you, it, you know, so if you're thinking of electronics, a new computer, for example, might be a good investment right now. Because that's going to get a lot more expensive. Uh, you know, you, use your imagination. Anything that's made outside of the United States is going to get very, very expensive here very soon. When I say expensive, it, in other words, your dollar ain't going to be able to buy it no more one last theme as we finish off the second half of the thanksgiving day video because i wanted you to think about this because remember the theme of the first well the two videos is evil exists and you have to accept it especially in the united states government and there's no more evidence of that than the money laundering that has taken place through ukraine it's made a lot of people extremely wealthy blackrock being among them Okay, and that's been the sole purpose. They were willing to sacrifice a million Ukrainians and God knows how many Russians have died just so that they could line their purses with by sending weapon systems and, and depleting the United States. Our defenses, I dare say, are a lot less uh, sufficient. If somebody wants to attack the United States, I'm not sure we've got the munitions in stock to survive more than a month or two with what we have in stock. So they were willing to do all of that just align their own pockets. That's pure evil. That's pure 
unadulterated evil. And think about the money that Joe Biden got from Ukraine. I mean, my God, his family, Hunter Biden, you know, was barista, made a fortune. They don't care. I mean, Lindsey Graham, they don't care about a million dead Ukrainians. And I say a million, you know, you hear everybody saying, well, it's about 600,000. Hell no, I've been following the damn war. I'm going to tell you right now, there's mass graves all over Ukraine. I could show you video after video of Ukrainian graveyards with those flags. I've shown you a few of them in previous videos. But I just, and then of course, they're willing to sacrifice the entire world out of greed. Understand, we have no skin in the game. Okay, if Russia were arming Mexico, I dare say we would attack Mexico. I use that as an example, but I want you to understand. So, okay. So if we threaten Russia, I would think that Russia would have the common sense to say, okay, I'm not going to nuclear war over Mexico. We just wanted to help them out a little bit because they're kind of a, a friend of ours. You know, I, I don't even consider Ukraine a friend. Th those are Nazis, man. There's a Banderas. They commit terrorist acts. I could show you a video. Well, maybe I will. I'll see what the length is. Where they just killed a bunch of uh, civilians and they were going to blame it on the Russians in Ser Servopol. I think that's the name of the town. Well, we're going to start now, though, with some disturbing news coming out. The Donetsk Republic, this is in the town of Selidova. Now, after taking control of the area at the end of October, Russian troops have been carrying out a house-to-house -house sweep of the settlement. And the emerging footage points to evidence of a brutal massacre occurring right before Russia gained control of the town. A warning because some of these images ahead are very unsettling. Well, Russian servicemen have been finding decomposed bodies across Selidova. The deceased were left in the wreckage of the town. The reports indicate the killings were likely to have been carried out five weeks ago. Well, RT's senior correspondent Murad Gazdiev brings us more. Well, now that the fog of war has more or less lifted, now that the front line has moved on beyond Selidova, Russian troops and investigators, military prosecutors have had the chance to walk through Selidova to, to count the dead, so to speak. They have found a multitude of civilians, people with signs of torture before their deaths, people executed with shots to the head. At least 10 bodies have been found, verified uh, so far civilians. There are many more buried under rubble. There are many more strewn amongst minefields left behind by Ukrainians uh, in mine buildings. Civilians killed as Ukrainian forces retreated. Now, we have spoken to uh, refugees from Selidova, and they all said, all of them, that they witnessed, that they saw, and that they heard Ukrainian soldiers executing civilians. They would break down the door and there was an elderly woman sitting in her apartment. They would tell her she's a traitor waiting for the Russians and shoot her. They killed eight people in my apartment building. Civilians, specifically civilians. No uniforms, no nothing. They would call you pro-Russian and shoot you. For what? Just for the heck of it. They told everyone, if you stay, you're a traitor waiting for the Russians. They executed civilians, just dumb killing. How? With assault rifles. No, why? Revenge, we're pro-Russians to them, hatred. I don't know what drugs they were on, but they were out of their minds. A neighbor ran to me and told me, Yulia, they killed your husband, right by our house. They shot him and two neighbors. We buried them ourselves in the yard. Local men helped me. Who did it? Ukrainian soldiers did it when they were running away. The Russians had entered the city. The Ukrainians ran and killed everyone they came across. My husband was outside the apartment block entrance when the Ukrainian soldiers came across him. They riddled everything with bullets. Now, these weren't people killed as collateral, for example. Uh, during the fighting by, by crossfire. These are people in basements with gunshot wounds to the head, people in, in their beds, uh, elders as well as younger folk in their apartments untouched by explosives, uh, but rather executed with shots to the back, shots to the, to the head. 
I went outside and I heard a Ukrainian soldier shouting, everyone out of the house, face the wall. And he stood up so that I could see him. I came out of the toilet and he started shooting at my wife. When I came back, I saw the completely burnt bodies of my family. I don't know, maybe they were punitive troops. I don't know what orders they were fulfilling. Or maybe they felt that Russian troops were already entering. Literally two days before that, they started killing people. We were just in shock. 90-year-old grandmas were just lying there. My neighbor who lived with me, they were all lying on the street, no one even brought them in, until Russia came. Only then were they returned to their families or buried. Before that, they were just killed and left there to blame Russia before its troops even arrived. But people here know everything. Worth bearing in mind is that as Ukrainian troops were pulling out and in the immediate aftermath and the days since, perhaps forewarned of what their troops had been up to in Solidova, Ukraine came out and officials said that Russians were killing civilians in Solidova. They cited an example saying that a car, a civilian car, was caught in the crossfire as battle in the, in the city. In the city raged. Of course, this has nothing on what has been found in Solidova. Ukraine didn't mention the multitude of civilians executed with shots to the head. Again, bodies that are dated five weeks ago, exactly as Ukrainian troops were pulling out in the, in the few days before that. Again, this, this is a throwback to what we saw in Mariupol, where hundreds of Ukrainian troops were implicated in the wanton killing of civilians, sporadic killing all over the city. What we have seen in Solidova mirrors what happened in Mariupol, though, due to population differences, is, is much smaller in scope. When the West started discussing peace talks, Zelensky started preparing the second butcher, but this time in Solidova. Now there are testimonies of victims and witnesses who escaped the murder in Solidova. They describe the events in detail with addresses, names of the killed, with descriptions of the punishers from the Kyiv regime. They state that the Nazis caused a bloodbath two or three days before the capture of the city by Russian troops. And a throwback again to what happened in Bucha, the same Bucha way which Kiev and uh, its sponsors in the, in the West came out and said the days after they entered the city that Russian forces had killed all, the, all these civilians. Yet, no, Russia says that it was Ukrainian troops, the nationalist elements who came into the city found all the people that they accused of collaborating with Russian forces and butchered them, then blaming Russia for their deaths. While these latest findings are still to be investigated, Ukrainian servicemen have been convicted for killing civilians in Mariupol in 2022. Two soldiers uh, shot an unarmed man back then who posed no threat, believing that he may hold pro-Russian views. The victim died from multiple gunshot wounds. Both servicemen were sentenced to 24 years and six months in a maximum security prison and efforts continued to identify others involved in the incident. And uh, luckily the, uh, the um, Russians overrode the town, but there's testimony after testimony of people saying that the Ukrainians were just lining up people and mercenaries. There was, there were some mercenaries in there and they were killing them all. And the plan was evidently to blame it on the Russians. That's pure evil. We're supporting an evil empire. And the, they're willing to go to nuclear war on something that's not, it's not in the interest of the American people. Do you give, are you, have you ever visited Ukraine? Are you ever going to Ukraine? Are you going to vacation in Ukraine? Have you ever gotten anything from Ukraine? As an American citizen, think about it. So why, why are we sending all of our blood and money and our weapons to a country that we don't give a shit about? Now Europe, maybe they want to care about Ukraine. But you know, and when I say I don't care, I care about the Ukrainian people. Okay, that are being murdered by the thousands. All right, you know, I, I do care about that. But I'm telling you, it's not in our strategic interest. It has nothing to do with the United States. And I put Israel in that category, but uh, obviously most, a lot of Americans do not because they're not in our strategic interest. We don't, Israel doesn't make anything for the United States. We're, they're not really much of a trade partner, you know. Maybe in cybersecurity, but even then, they use it against us. 
<laughs> you know, they've they've developed some uh, some cybersecurity threats <laughs> that we found out about that they didn't share with us so that we could use them against our our potential enemies. You know, so they're willing to end the whole world because they are evil people. The Democrats are evil. And when I say Democrats, remember I'm including Mitch McConnell, the three people he's got uh, trash on, and a lot of, you know, and a lot of other Republicans. That, well, Tom Cotton, for example, Lindsey Graham. So don't think I'm not talking about the rhinos too. And that's it. We'll finish off the second video here. Peace out and stay free. But I want you to think about why would you want to end the United States as a nation over something that has nothing to do with the average American, I bet, I bet, okay, here's a test for you. Go up to a Democrat and say, show, you know, you've got that Democrat flag in your windows. Show me in, and hand them a globe. You know, one that's probably not labeled in big letters. And say, show me where Ukraine is on this globe. I guarantee you, they won't even be able to show you where it is. Or ask them, what, what continent? You know, ask the average person, what continent is Ukraine on? I don't know. Okay, is it, is it in... Is it in Europe, maybe, you know? Is it in Central Asia? Is it in both? Okay, ask them. See what they say. They don't even know where it is. They probably don't even know where sitting. all their tax money is going to Ukraine. All right, that's it. Peace out. Stay free. Thank, have a happy Thanksgiving. Bye-bye. All right, I had to get something funny on the video <laughs> after all so much gloom and doom. So, you know, while I was talking, you know, making the video, the, the last clip on the, the second half here. I, I, you know, I didn't realize, but I walked right off the trail and I'd walked over into the woods over here and uh, I got pretty deep in. I'm, so, I'm surprised I didn't hit a log or trip on something or God knows I'm going to have to check myself for ticks back home because I knew I was brushing into stuff. I was like, I should have realized it, but you know, you get into talking and you're thinking, you know, and trying to do it. Anyway, when I cut the uh, camera off, you know, because my light vision came back, and I went, where in the hell am I? <laughs> I was like, where, where did the trail go, you know? So I had to walk around in them woods for a little while to find my way back to the trail. And uh, anyway, I just thought you'd find that a funny story. Man, I'm on the way home. I don't know what the hell's going on. I don't know if I can get any of this on the video. There are about 10 emergency vehicles here at an intersection. Something big must have happened. I don't think they're going to like me filming. I was trying to just actually get around it, but I made a wrong turn. <laughs> Let's see if we can figure out what's going on here. I mean, if it was just an accident, why do you have so many? And by the way, there's been about four emergency vehicles that have taken off. I don't see, uh, I don't see what's going on. Oh, there it is. There's a car right there just demolished. But why do they need so many emergency vehicles for that? There's another car back here. Holy moly. Well, anyway, I don't want to get in the way. They don't like you filming this stuff.